Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the briefing room. I'm your host, Abu Hamza. The Punland elections happened on the 8th of January, and we have a winner. But before we go into that, let's have a look at how far Punland has come in the last 13 years. Somaliland and Punland are slightly similar in this aspect, you know, in the way that they came together between themselves to create some form of a governing structure. Now, Somaliland came together and formed the Bodoma Conference in 1993, where the traditional elders, politicians, members of the business community, intellectuals and other civil society representatives decided together on how to move forward over a period of time. Now the same happened in Punland during the Gerawa Conference in 1998, in which Punland was officially established. Now both regions have one thing in common when it comes to the political governance of their respective territories. They base their support upon clan elders and their organizational structure along lines based on clan relationships and kinship. Now, Pernland's first president was Abdullahi Yusuf Ahmed, and he led Pernland until the 10th of October 2004, when he, after which he became the president of the Somali transitional government. He was then followed by General Mahmoud Musa Hirsi Adde, who led Pernland until 2009. So that was a, uh, another five years. And during those five years, he brought constitutional, political, as well as social reforms, including a referendum, the creation of an electoral commission, as well as local and parliamentary elections. And that's when Abdurrahman Mohammed Mahmoud Farala came in, on the 8th of January 2009. And he has continued the reform process that was already in place. Now, during his governance of Pinland, his government set up the democratization of Pinland establishing local election laws, as well as political association laws, amongst many others. Now initially, nine political parties were declared in Pinland towards the end of 2012, around October. But by the end of the year, the closing day for the registration period on the 31st of December, the Transitional Pinland Electoral Commission announced that only six political associations have been provisionally registered and met the requirements set by them. The following week, the first week of 2013, the government made a declaration that only three official political parties will be allowed in Pinland. The same number, by the way, as Somaliland. And that each political party will appoint their members to the permanent Pinland Electoral Commission to guide upcoming parliamentary and presidential elections. Now, this led to the extension of President Farola's term for one more year and has brought us to the Pinland presidential elections in January 2014. Now, the main race was rumoured to be between former Prime Minister of the Somali Transitional Government, Abdul Mohammed Ali Gass, and the incumbent President Abdurrahman Farale. But, but, there was a third candidate that became a real contender on the day itself, Ali Haji Warsame. And he was able to throw a spanner in the works a little for the other candidates, because, you know, he was dividing all the votes. With any presidential race, though, the incumbent always has some sort of advantage. I mean, he has the job experience, having been in the post for a term already. He can name his achievements to date, as well as the areas in which he will improve on further with, like a second, with the second term. Now, the final contender for the presidential race was former Somali Prime Minister Abdul Mohammed Ali Gass. Now, Abdul is also originally from Finland and has been widely credited with devising the formal roadmap for the end of the transition. The political process which would allow the establishment of permanent democratic institutions in Somalia by mid-2012, when the transitional federal government's mandate expired. He was also instrumental in the Gadawa agreements. He continued being influential in the forming of the draft constitution, after which he put himself forward as a presidential candidate in the election of the Somali government. He was among the four contestants that made it to the second round of voting, but with not enough votes to win the elections, he dropped out. And then, in August last year, a year after that, he announced his candidacy for the president of Pinland. Now, Abdiwali and the incumbent Pinland president Farale were the last two left in the third round of voting. Now, Farale was initially leading the final round with 31 votes. And Abdiwali only had 18 votes. And then, then came the clincher. 
the moment that was unexpected by some, preferred by many, and a decisive moment in the elections. During the final votes that were cast, one vote was deemed inadmissible. One vote. So they counted the votes with President Farala getting 32 and Abdul getting 33. The one inadmissible vote gave Abdul victory and officially made him the fifth president of Finland. Now, we congratulate him on his victory. We recognize his many achievements and look forward to the development he will bring to Finland and its citizens. A lot of people have since started calling for President Abdul to make some immediate changes, such as changing the title from president to governor to re-establish relations with the Somali federal government and to work together with the Somaliland government in brokering peace over contested regions. It's all possible. Having worked in the Somali government, he still has many friends and connections over there and since he was the one who was so instrumental in its formation, he could be the one that brings them closer together. He is also the gateway between, physically, Finland is the gateway between Somaliland and Somalia. And Abdul understands the political process. He understands what part of the constitutions of Finland and Somalia are similar and which differ. And he also understands who the stakeholders are. But the question is, will he continue to be looking out for the interests of the Somali government and try to bring Finland in line with their requirements? Or will he serve the interests of Finland alone and sever any previous allegiances he may have had with the Somali government? I mean, only time will tell. And this is when things get a little bit interesting because anything is possible. Now, some of the things that could be done, and this, if possible, honestly, it would really and truly become magnificently interesting <laughs> in Somali politics, is if Finland just decides, you know what, we don't want to be part of the union anymore. We are going to become an autonomous state in our, in our own region, in our own aspect, we will form, continue to have our own government and we have nothing to do with, with Somalia as a whole anymore. And that becomes problematic for the Republic of Somalia because over the last decade or so, over the last even 15 years, it has been Finland who has been so influential in trying to keep up the idea of a Somali union. I mean, it was Finland who has been able to provide certain parts of security. It has been Finland who has always been you know, the, the poster child almost, to anyone wanting to become a state within a, fed, within a bigger aspect of, of, a, of a federal country. And, and to be part of this form of federalism, Finland was almost leading the way and its, its example was being followed by others. Its example was being followed by Jubaland, for example. Now, if Finland decides for whatever reason to break away from this, and it's possible, I mean, the relations right now are, are not good at all. But Poland decides to break away from this. What should his next step be? And how many f more states will break away? And would it even be feasible or possible for, for whatever reason, for Poland and Somaliland to get together and say, hey, let's just form our own little union. Let's, let's not include South Central whatsoever. And let's just keep it to the northern side. And who would stop them? Who would be able to say, hey, you know, you guys can't do this because if Somaliland and Finland, the only two you know, reasonably stable regions within the Somali Peninsula have been able to come together and say, hey, we're just going to do this together by ourselves. Would the case for international recognition become a lot easier? And would Somaliland actually accept Finland and, 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 and accept a union between the two because the, the complaints have always been about Mogadishu, it's always been about the South. And if Somalia and the Finland get together, it could also resolve the actual land disputes that are happening right now in Sol um, and Ain. It's probably just an idea, it's a fantasy, it's probably never going to happen. Um, but if it would, or if some people are even considering it, or considering some sort of allegiance or some sort of working partnership that would allow both of them to do this and continue working together, it would only be, be, it would only be for the best interest of the Somali people. It would only be for the best interest for the Somali Peninsula as a whole. So you never know. But we'll keep an eye on it. Again, we wish Abdul nothing but the best, and we look forward to see how he helps develop Finland for its citizens. Now, thank you for watching, and hopefully we'll catch you after the break.
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the briefing room. My name is Samira Ahmed and I'm your co host. Here with me is Awa Hamza. Hi. Now, uh, for the second half of this show, I really wanted to cover the new selection of the cabinet in the Somali federal government. Now, the new Prime Minister, uh, Abdi Wali Sheikh Ahmed, has selected 55 new politicians consisting of 25 ministers, 25 deputy ministers, and five state ministers. Now, Hamza, I mean, this has been a long-awaited list. Um, it's really interesting to see uh, a, a few of the more experienced ministers actually not be included in the new cabinet. What would you think of this? Uh, it is very interesting. It's because they initially thought that because of the whole vote of no confidence thing, and there was there seemed to have been like quite a, a inner group and inner clique within the the, the, the cabinet ministers that were not with uh, ex-Prime Minister Sheridan um, and they weren't attending any of his meetings and they were quite basically just ensuring that they may uh, kept their, their, their job safe. So speculation was then going on thinking, okay, they must be on the president's side and it seemed to be that they actually were with the president. And then when the new list came out, a lot of them were not on that list. I mean, there are a few that did come back in, but some of the, the, the heavyweights, for example, were, were not on the list at all. And some, there are some very disappointing people that were missed out. Well, well, I mean, there are a few n notable people that have been excluded. Obviously, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, who also had the secondary role of the, the Foreign Minister, uh, Fosia Haji uh, Aden. Um, not too sure if sh uh, you know, she will necessarily be missed. If we're talking about competence, a lot of people have actually criticised her um, for the way that she executed her role during her time. Um, but then there, there's, there's, there's some individuals like Mariam Qasim, um, who had one of the most challenging ministerial positions, um, who's well loved by the people within the country, in the diaspora, um, had a lot of allies within the cabinet, and, and, and still has, has not been included in the cabinet. Seems like a real shame, doesn't it? it? I mean, it does. I mean, there's there's people on both sides of the fence. There's a lot of people who are real supporters of of uh, of, of Fozia Yusuf and the way she handles herself and just everything that she is because she's a woman in that position it's not uh, these type of posts are normally not given to a woman like this and it was interesting to see that the way she executed her her job was so controversial to so many people so many people, either you hated her or, or you loved her um, and there are certain statements that stick to people's minds of course um, especially when it came to when it comes to aid and, and money coming in, as a lot of people, when, when she criticised the EU and then later obviously rescinded a statement. So it's, it's interesting to see that the, some of the controversial figures are no longer within the cabinet. But Madam Qasim, for example, nothing controversial about her whatsoever. It's, she, had, she had no people, that no one was against her within the ministry, no one was against her in, inside the government necessarily, that had any outspoken uh, objections to her. There's no one who didn't like her in the diaspora. She's a very well-grounded woman. She has been um, quite, quite experienced within some parts of the Somali politics. This is obviously her, her second time as, as, as being involved in Somali politics and the Somali government itself. Um, she has been, one, obviously a leader of a political party before. She herself is a doctor. She has extensive medical experience. So it, it seemed quite natural for her to be you know, given a ministerial position that had to do with health, but then obviously education came into it, and 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 obviously there was quite others. She had like about five portfolios within one ministry, and it was it was almost too much to take. But if anyone was competent, if there was if there was a competent person within the ministry that everyone just agreed, you know what? Yes, we agree that this person has executed their job to the best of their ability within the circumstances. It was going to be money passing. Um, I know, for example, that you know when she started the whole uh, the vaccination process to, to get a lot of those things going on, she tried to uh, nationalise certain curriculum and she had the whole go to school project. Um, and there's a, a lot of things that she was involved with that would have start, set a foundation for things that would, would have moved forward quite quickly and quite smoothly. But for her to not be included again, it's, it's quite a shock. And it, I'm not sure whether it's got to do with because there's obviously so, some some rumors that it's it's her health. She didn't want to take up the position, um, or whether it's just got to do with that she wasn't selected. 
Um, and it's interesting, it's interesting, especially when you look at those two powerhouses, you look at Mariam Qasim and you look at Rozier Yusuf. It's, they had very prominent positions within the cabinet. And now, with the new cabinet ministry, I mean, they've increased it from having 10 to 25, um, as well as having another 25 deputy ministers and then five state ministers, which is a total cabinet of 55 people. But from having two women who have such prominent positions as the deputy prime minister and the foreign minister, as well as obviously the, the portfolio that Mariam Qasim had, to now getting another two women within the, the 25 and 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 the roles that they're given. I mean, I mean, this is completely absurd. We've gone from having two women in some of the most senior roles in the country. You know, in terms of in the continent, anyway, it's something that's really revolutionary and really pleasing for us to see. And now, what are the roles that the women are getting? Something like you know, M minister for, for gender or minister something. Minister for gender, <laughs> and and it's it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Some of the things that 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 we it's it's almost like uh, for very specific purposes they were not given prominent positions because these had either been promised to somebody else or had been ultimately given to somebody else. Um, and it's, it's interesting to look at how they've done this because when, when you look at the, the breakdown of the minister, it seems that some parts seem a little bit, not irrelevant, but does there need to be like a whole ministry for it? And it's, it's almost like you had issues paying your ministers on time when there was just 10. How are you going to pay the ministries of 25 ministers and the deputy ministers and their team and the whole office? And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to see how they're going to try and, and work that one out. I mean, it will be interesting to see um, how things do pan out for them. Um, now, in terms of um, resignations, we've already had two. I know that one of them is the, the, the mayor of Mogadishu. Tarzan has already resigned from the ministerial position that he was uh, appointed to because he wasn't even aware that he had you know, been nominated for the role and the first time he heard of this was uh, allegedly through the media. I mean, yeah, I mean, he was obviously put forward to be the deputy minister of, uh, of sports and youth <laughs> and he then argued, he then had a, a press conference and it wasn't that it's an offhanded comment or anyone uh, received any sort of you know, official letter that was intercepted or certain information that was leaked. It was nothing like that whatsoever. He just had a press conference the next morning and said, hey guys, by the way, I know I was nominated for this, but I was not consulted. Nobody told me. I, I didn't even want a ministerial job, so why would I want to have a deputy minister's uh, job? Uh, it's not in my interest. And I'm, me having been listed now, I'm resigning already. Um, and, and at least at least he did that. At least it was for his own personal reasons, say like he just didn't want to pick up the wall. I mean, he was one of two. And the second yeah. one is a little bit more interesting. I mean, uh, this one was to become the Deputy Minister of, of Energy and Water, I think it was. And his argument for not wanting to uh, take up the position was basically, hey guys, by the way, for my sub-clan to get uh, a Deputy Minister's role uh, and for me to represent my sub-clan in this role, we deserve to at least have a ministerial role. It's not to be a deputy minister, but to be an actual minister. Well, I think the exact words were, it's, it's too low profile of a role for, for my clan to accept. And, 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 it, yeah, and he, yeah. he then resigned saying, you know, and I, I resigned with the full support of my sub-clan. And it's interesting, it's interesting because it's, it's all about how the formula, the 4.5 formula, and now as everything else is being worked out. And it, if you look at how the ministry is being done right now, it isn't being used at all. The 4.5 formula is only being used in Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, the 4.5 formula is only being used to gather enough MPs in certain positions to be able to say, okay, hey guys, by the way, we have a Parliament that somehow, some way conforms or is close enough to the whole 4.5 formula. But that's just in Parliament. When it comes to the Prime Minister and the President's role, it seems to only be for two particular clans. Uh, and that needs to change as well. When it comes to the ministerial ones, there doesn't seem to be any real formula that's being applied here. So I disagree with the 4.5 formula, but I'm thinking, okay, if you are going to use it, then it needs to be consistent. Yeah. No, use it in parliament, use it uh, in the in the in the cabinet, use it for the the prime minister or the president's job, and use it throughout. Use it for every single thing that you're going to do it with, and not just use it haphazardly. And the same applies again for. Um, this whole federalism 
aspect of governing. It's when you have a, a new cabinet where they, they come together and you have like 25 of them. You think to yourself, okay, so there must be somewhere, somehow, somebody in charge of reconciliation or anything else like that. And then you think to yourself, actually, wait, no, you look at the whole list and there's not a single ministry that's in charge of reconciliation. Um, there's someone in charge of federalism uh, and, and the interior ministry, uh, there's someone in charge of national security, education, anything else that you can think of. But when it comes to actual reconciliation, Nobody there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad at least they put somebody in there for, um, the, for constitutional affairs and justice. At least there's, there's something that, that's, mm -hmm. that's in charge of that. But to have nobody there for actual reconciliation purposes and for uh, no commission to have been set up or anything else to be done, it's quite disappointing. Um, and you look at the long list, and one of the things that we argue for a lot is to have some sort of background. How was this person chosen? Why were they chosen? What were their skills? What was their CV? What was it that they bring to the table that, that made you think, actually, you know what? Yes, this person is the right person for the job. You know? um, and, and we didn't get any of that. It's the list was chosen after obviously some long deliberation, but we have no real background to who these people are, whether it's the first time two ministerial positions, whether they've ever been involved in politics before, or anything else like that. It's, a lot of this should be a lot more transparent. A lot, a lot of this should be a lot more public. Um, and if it was, then any rumours of the, the new Prime Minister having been pressured by the President would have been squashed straight away. It's they, it, they wouldn't have shown, they, they would have, it would have very quickly shown who is making the real decisions mm -hmm. and where the, the, the division of power lies between the Prime Minister's office and the President's office because uh, right now it's, it's rumoured to obviously for the Prime Minister to still be in Villa Somalia. Um, and for him to be so close around the president, it's of course you're going to get a bit of pressure. Um, so it's interesting to see how that goes, and it's. I'd be surprised if if further backlash doesn't come from this. I'd be very surprised. Well, I mean, it's definitely given us a clear indication of what the the, the SFG's priorities are uh, within the, for the rest of the years, just by looking at the, the posts that have been assigned. But we will have to leave it there for now. Uh, you've been watching The Briefing Room. I'm your host, Samira Ahmed. Jazakallah khairan for watching, um, and hopefully we'll catch you guys next time.